welcome and thanks to all of you that have joined us today, either for this live episode or perhaps you're tuning in to a recording. Either way, thrilled to have you either watching or listening. Today, we're going to talk about what does a COO do and do you need one? And we're talking about this with Dean Scheinert, who is serving as the Chief Operations Officer at St. Joseph the Worker. And we're excited to have you with us today. Thanks to Julia Patrick, CEO of the American Nonprofit Academy, that got this show going and growing. We are on to our 500 plus plus episode. I'm honored to serve alongside Julia as the co-host. I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd, CEO of the Raven Group. And Julia and I are both esteemed to have the continued support from our presenting sponsors. For those of you that are watching, you can see these on your screen. Those of you that are listening, I would like to give a shout out to Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy, Nonprofit Nerd, your part-time controller, the Nonprofit Atlas, Nonprofit Thought Leader, as well as Staffing Boutique. I mentioned we have over 500 episodes. There's actually over 800 video elements. You can find them on Roku, YouTube, Fire TV, as well as Vimeo. Plus, we are now streaming on podcasts. So wherever you listen to your podcast and you stream your favorite podcast, go ahead and queue up the Nonprofit Show because Dean Scheinert, Thrilled to have you here. This episode will not only go to our video platforms, but also that podcast. So welcome, my friend. I'm glad to have you with me this morning. Thank you, Jared. I've been looking forward to this all week since you invited me. I'm, I'm excited. Uh, this is something that, you know, kind of tongue in cheek, you said to me, Dean, when do I get to have a guest episode on the show? And I said, your time's coming. You just wait. So, so here it is, Dean Shiner, Chief Operations Officer at St. Joseph the Worker. That is quite a big job. Why don't you tell us a little bit about St. Joseph the Worker and your role there? Sure. So St. Joseph the Worker has been present here in the Valley for over 34 years. Our mission is straight and forward. We help disadvantaged communities and populations, including homeless, substance people coming out of substance abuse, even people coming out of prison, find jobs. It's a hand up strategy to addressing the homeless problem here in Phoenix. Fantastic, that is quite a big, quite a big mission. Well, as we move into this, you know, let's start off with a very simplistic, or is it simplistic, question. What exactly is a COO? So I have a feeling that our whole conversation is not going to be very simplistic. The questions are fairly simple, but the answers, there, there's no nothing cut in stone. So uh, a COO is just what it says. It's a chief operations or chief operating officer. The role encompasses responsibility for the day-to-day -day workings of any organization. Where it lives on the org chart really depends on the organization. Um, in our case here at St. Joseph the Worker, um, I sit um, on the org chart along with our chief philanthropy officer reporting directly into our CEO. Nice, yeah. You're right. And, and there's a lot of talk right now, Dean, that's it's a big trend about co-leadership. And so, you know, really looking at how do we divide the day-to-day -day operations and everything, you know, within the, the organization. So having that COO really, I believe, helps to relieve a lot of the pressure of those day-to-day -day responsibilities with that CEO. Um, so thank you for that answer. And you're right. This they're simple questions. They're not necessarily simple answers because every organization, they could, they could approach this differently. Um, let's move into the learning curve and the role as an effective change agent. What has your personal learning curve been in this new role as COO, Dean? Oh, wow. Um, great question. And I would say that my experience has been a little bit out of the box, frankly. Uh, I've never been a COO before, um, okay. and if you can't tell already, um, I'm sort of mid, later stages of my career. Um, in fact, I had not worked in the nonprofit sector up until about six or seven years ago. So I am on a very steep learning curve, and that's a function not only 
of my prior experience outside of philanthropy and even outside of the social services, but also by the nature of our organization. So my learning curve has, has been, as I said, really steep. Uh, I came in here in January and it was a perfect storm. And I say that in a good way. It was a perfect storm of events that really had me jump right in. Uh, we are an organization that is growing by leaps and bounds. Our budget has more than doubled over the last year. Um, we, and with that comes more programming, more staff, and more complexity. And to boot, um, our executive director, uh, who is the face of our organization, had to go on medical leave for about three months. So I really had to immerse myself into everything about St. Joseph the Worker. Our people, our clients, our programs, our processes, and I wouldn't have been able to do it without a very valuable sidekick um, at my side. I could never have done it alone. So, um, and as far as a change agent goes, I think the instinct for a lot of people when they come into a new role is to like, okay, I'm going to come in and I'm going to do my thing. And, you know, I, I, I'll have respect for what's in place but I'm gonna change things and do it my way. In fact, I was hired to, to make, bring change to the organization. But my personal style is to be methodical, thoughtful, be a good listener, and really get my arms around what the organization looks like before I affect change. And now almost four months in, and thank, and, and, and in large part because I have such great colleagues at the leadership level and at the staff level, we are now ready to affect that positive change within the organization. Yeah, fantastic. How much does empathy play in this role? A lot. Um, yeah. And we are an organization that uh, prides itself on, on empathy as, as a result of the type of work we do and the clientele that we're working with. But putting that aside, I think to be an effective leader, whether you're the CEO or the chief philanthropy officer or the chief administrator officer or the CEO like myself, you have to be able to put yourself in other people's shoes. You have to be a good listener. You have to understand what every individual skill set is and what their potential for growth is and expanding that skill set. So you really have to learn and, and a lot about what drives other people. And for me personally, that's been my go-to uh, in addition to what I said earlier about having great partners. Uh, I have really had to leverage the empathy that I think I, I bring to the table to be successful. You know, there's a lot of articles, white papers, blog post right now about leadership and empathy and how empathy is probably the largest characteristic, greatest characteristic that so many of our leaders, as you just said, regardless of your title, regardless of your role, is really, you know, a great uh, characteristic trait in, in that leadership. So thank you. Thank you for touching on that. How have you been embraced? Because I understand this is truly the first time that this organization over 30 years, 33 years for St. Joseph the Worker. So this is the first time that the org chart has introduced that COO. How has this looked like by way of, of you coming in, being embraced for this first time opportunity? The most important thing for me, and I, I shared this with uh, our CEO, and our consultant who hired me, the most important thing for me to do when I stepped into this role was to establish trust and credibility. And I recognized that I absolutely had to earn it. It is not a rubber stamp that I'm gonna walk in here with a title and a resume and people are all of a sudden gonna trust me. That goes for any organization, but it's even more so given our organization in, the, in, in terms of the nature of the work that we do. Uh, we have a lot of staff members who have had life experiences. So quite frankly, you know, trust is an issue, um, especially when we have a leader who's been running the organization for 10 years um, and has been the rainmaker. Um, and when you compound that, that 
uh, our CEO had to go on medical leave, you can just see the challenges that I face. And again, I'm an outsider. Um, I'd never been a COO before. If somebody looked at my resume, I was working in banking six years ago. I wasn't even living in Phoenix 10 years ago. So truth be told, I was not embraced initially. And I, I it was hard. I mean, I, I really tried to not take it personally, but I'm human and I did a little bit, but I, I stayed the course and I recognized that this was not about me personally. It's about the organization and how I have to evolve and integrate myself into everything St. Joseph the Worker. And I can honestly say that now four months in, I've, I've actually turned the corner and I didn't do it by myself, but I feel that I am now being embraced and it feels really good. Um, and my goal is to make this organization the best place possible to work. And I think our staff are, bu are buying into that. Fantastic. You know, I, you're right. Anytime a leader comes in at, at any position, but especially in those leadership, the executive leadership office, some people refer to it as the C-suite, right? I think that it incites a little bit of fear, fear of the unknown, fear of change, fear of new staff, fear of is my job, you know, secure? What does that look like? We've seen it happen during, you know, some people call it the great resignation. Others are calling it the great reshuffle and uh, and really looking at, OK, when a new leadership comes into place, how might that change the dynamics of our organization? So I think and, you spoke to that so perfectly, eloquently. And let's not forget COVID, right? I mean, let's not forget COVID. we all have PTSD uh, and I, you know, I don't use that term uh, lightly, um, but I think a lot of people do have PTSD from COVID um, in terms Absolutely. of what, what, the, what the work environment looks like going forward. Yeah. So that played into it as well. Great, you know, great point because we're not quite in the endemic uh, stage of this, but, you know, we're still having to navigate, you know, just really everything with the global health crisis. Um, so thank you for bringing that to the to the front as well. What about the long term impacts of having and using a COO effectively within your organization? What might we see, you know, over years? Because, again, this isn't this isn't overnight. You had just shared that you've been here, you know, four months working with this organization and you're just starting to turn some corners, really establishing some roots, some rapport, some trust. So what will these long-term impacts mean for this organization? It's evolving, Jared. Um, honestly, um, this was an organization that was really run as a family very successfully. And to the credit of our CEO, to our credit of our consultant uh, who helped hire me and to the credit of the board, um, they recognized that there was a need for this role. Um, so what the organization laid out for my role is great as a start, but I think we all have to be flexible and figure out what the role of the COO is going to be within this organization. As I envision it, as we talked about, we are growing by leaps and bounds. We are uh, at the, the nexus of a lot of uh, trends that are going on, increase in homelessness, increase in government funding to, ha to help this, this problem. Um, there's a, a shortage of employees out there. So so we are right in the in the sweet spot of all these things are going on. And I think the COO is going to be integral to figure out uh, how we sustain our model, but configure it for the future. Um, and it's it's going to be changing every minute. But as long as the leadership and the board understands that it's not set in stone what the COO is going to look like here going forward, we're going to be successful. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's so important. And, you know, really, as you look at everything that happens within an organization, the board are fiduciary agents and they work so closely with the CEO. The leadership team is really responsible for the day to day operations that happen 
within the offices, within the programming, within the fundraising department. And so there's a lot of moving pieces to this. You touched a little bit about how it's an evolution. And I'm curious, Dean, if the evolution also means that the COO perhaps is heir apparent, meaning does this like innately bake in some succession planning? So the CEO, COO, excuse me, is a very, has very important input into the succession plan. However, that doesn't mean the COO has a red carpet to the CEO role. Um, it, it, not at all. Uh, and again, I, I discussed earlier about how the CEO, CEO role is going to evolve here. So it, it doesn't necessarily mean uh, I or any other CEO has a leg up. I mean, you can think of countless organizations where, you know, the head of programming or the chief financial officer um, becomes the CEO. So uh, it really depends on the organization. It really depends on the job performance of the CEO, COO, how readily the COO takes to the mission, uh, how staff takes to the COO, how the board takes to the COO. So nothing is set in stone. Um, so that, that really um, is an open, uh, an open question. Sure, the COO is, you know, is in the mix, but uh, it's not a fait accompli that that CEO graduates to the CEO. The CEO could stay on board for another 15, 20 years. Right. And as you said, you know, the CEO really has a lot of insight and conversation into the succession conversation. Um, I think you know this. I am a huge advocate for professional interim succession leaders. That could be an interim CEO, COO, whichever role that looks like. Um, I think that actually also is an advantage to perhaps the COO or another leader, because it gives them the true ability to step into the role uh, without kind of like playing a substitute teacher in that space, if you will. Um, so, so I've always been a huge advocate of interim succession leaders. And uh, I think, you know, as we look at succession planning, I hope, honestly, Dean, that it's not just the CEO that's considering their succession, right? It's really kind of at all of these layers throughout the org chart. And that's, you know, what we talked about first is what is a COO and where do they sit on the org chart? And so really looking at succession planning, I think holistically through the organization is probably best. Yeah, and the more input you can have into that decision making, the better. Um, and one other thing, I the the the, the beauty of having um, uh, an outsourced uh, piece to this in terms of the input is that that person brings a level of objectivity to the table that might not be as not not but might not be as present if you have somebody who's totally immersed into the operations there's a little bit of a separation which could be helpful i agree i call that truth to power <laughs> right and we're able because i've served in this role in several capacities with several different agencies throughout the nation in fact and really working in that space of truth to power because i'm not so worried about my job security i'm able to pull back pull back the curtains, show some of the dust bunnies that have been hanging around and they need to be swept out, right? So looking looking at some of that. Um, I would like, if you are willing, Dean, to throw you a curveball because again, if any of you joined us in the green room chatter, Dean is in fact a fanatic when it comes to baseball. But my curveball, um, I know you're gonna hit a home run, so no pressure here, but I know you can. Um, it really goes back to what you stated. Six years ago, you were in the banking business. Ten years ago, you did not live in the community in which you're serving as a COO. What insight and suggestions would you give to other professionals like yourself that are looking to intentionally move career into the not-for-profit not sector to serve in a capacity of leadership like this? Because I hear this quite a bit, you know, and I hear individuals saying, is this relatable? Are my skill sets, you know, are they going to be welcomed in the nonprofit sector? 
What insight would you provide? Sure. So the first is to know yourself um, and get your arms around your capacity for risk at the stage of life where you're considering this. Um, because uh, you need to be honest with yourself about whether or not you have the stomach mid-career to change. You also have to be honest with yourself whether or not you have the skills to transition to this new career that you have outlined for yourself. Once you've gotten over those couple of, um, not obstacles, but steps, I think that you have to be very open to networking, building relationships, and having conviction to know like, this is the goal and this is what I want to do. And you may have spent the first 30 years of your career, most of which relying on yourself, but now you are in a position where you will do best by by being open to getting the help from others in terms of introductions, even hiring a coach, um, even participating in leadership um, seminars, uh, which may seem rudimentary to you. Like, why am I doing this? I've been in the work workforce for 30 years, um, but you need to be open to that. And then again, not everybody might be a for as fortunate as I was, but to have the support of friends and family goes a long way to, to making this happen. And you know what? Like in baseball, you need a little luck. <laughs> great advice. Great advice. I knew you would hit it out of the park. And again, this is this is a common a question that I personally have heard, um, you know, quite a, quite a bit of individuals wanting to transition into being of service, you know, in this way. And so I'm so glad to have you here to talk about your COO experience serving for St. Joseph the Worker. So Dean Scheinert, thank you so very much. If any of you are interested in contacting Dean, learning more about St. Joseph the Worker, please uh, take note of his email here, as well as the web address for St. Joseph the Worker. So it's D Scheinert, S-C-H-E-I-N-E-R-T, at sjwjobs.org. It's a mouthful. Um, but Dean, thank you. It's fantastic. I get the, the great pleasure of working so closely with you day in and day out, uh, living here in the community and working so closely you know, on this mission as well. So grateful, grateful to have you. Thank you, Jared. And thank you for all those who tuned in. Absolutely. We, we had quite a bit Julia Patrick's enjoying some enjoying, excuse me, some time in California. We all deserve a little R and R, and I hope that she's having a fantastic time. I'm Jarrett Ransom, your nonprofit nerd. Again, we are honored to have the continued support of our presenting sponsors. They are Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, Fundraising Academy, Nonprofit Nerd, Your Part-Time Controller, The Nonprofit Atlas, Nonprofit Thought Leader, as well as Staffing Boutique. So thank you. And please do check out those companies because they are here to help you move the needle with your mission. So check them out. They're fantastic companies. Um, I've had great opportunity to work with several of them with many organizations, and I've got to see their good work. Uh, put put into action. So Dean, thank you again. And to all of you that joined us live or watching this recording, grateful to have you here. I'm Jarrett Ransom, the nonprofit nerd, and please join us back here tomorrow. Until then, stay well so you can do well. <laughs>